Hello dog lovers, and this is Leah Will with The Balanced Dog. In this video today, we will discuss rewards. So if you haven't already watched How Dogs Learn and my training sequence video, I would suggest that you would go back and do those first. It will give you a little bit better understanding about the things we discuss in this video specifically. So rewards, what is a reward? Well, a reward is anything that your dog finds valuable. I like to think of it almost like a monetary scale because us as humans function in the world and use money. So if you're thinking about rewards, if you go to work and you perform the behaviors, the tasks you're supposed to perform at work, then at the end of the day or the end of the week or the month, you get a paycheck. And then your place of you know, employment says, we appreciate the work that you've put in the behaviors you've done that we need you to do, and we have paid you in money. So then you get your paycheck and are like, okay, that I've decided is worth my time. Now, your dog, if it was up to them, would spend their whole day doing things that they would get in reinforced for naturally. So sniffing out food, um, chasing animals, sleeping, you know, playing in the water. Those are things that dogs can find reinforcing. So we take those dogs and say, hey, we would like you to live in our human world, but we need you to do certain behaviors. We don't want you to chase the cat. We don't want you to, you know, jump all over the neighbor kids. So the dog is now being asked to do behaviors that fit in our world where they live with us, just like we are expected to do different behaviors when we go off to work. So if you think of it like that, I think it sets you up for a better understanding of why we even care about rewards, but also by using rewards with your dog and showing them that when they follow through on behaviors that you want, that they get paid for it, you will start to become higher value regardless of what's going on in the environment. So you will have better recall. You will have a well better behaved dog because they will start to look to you to say, hey, what behaviors would you like me to do? Because I would like to get paid for that. Now, when we're teaching a new behavior, you, we've talked about this in the training sequence video, you want to reward a lot, like 100%. And that's because we can't tell the dog in English or German, French, Spanish, whatever language you speak, you cannot tell the dog through language what is expected of them. You can try, but your dog doesn't care. So we have to use our rewards to reinforce the behaviors that we want to get the dog's attention to say that is worth your time to do for me. Now, once the dog does it, and goes, oh, it is worth my time. I enjoy that, that's great. I'll get paid for it. Happy endorphins in the brain. Then you can slowly phase that reward out. And that also was talked about in the training sequence. As you will see me work through other videos in the future here, you will see me doing different reward scales, whether I'm rewarding after each time, whether I'm rewarding after a random amount of times. It all depends on where the dog is at in their training. So with that, I usually hand out a blank reward scale to client, in-person clients. When I did group classes or one-on-ones, I would hand out this scale. And it has low value all the way to high value. And it's empty because every dog finds rewards, different value, and some rewards they don't find valuable at all. So you need to gear it specifically to your dog at home, not a general idea of this is reward scale for all dogs, because that's not a thing. Um, and if somebody tells you it is, it's crap. So I like to think of the main things that we can use that we have access to that are easy to work with when you're working with your dog. Um, you also will run into a couple of, they're not really problems, but I find clients run into either of these situations and go, my rewards don't work, and they just stop doing them altogether. So those two main problems 
or issues, I guess is the best way to say it, are one, what you're trying to reward your dog with in the environment that you're working is not high value enough. It would be like telling your child to go there and sit down and be patient and you will give them a piece of broccoli. Why, why would they want to do anything for a piece of broccoli? I mean, unless your child really loves broccoli, which is, that'd be great. So you would get a different response if you said, hey, if you can sit there and be quiet for five minutes, I'll give you a candy bar or I will give you a dollar, you know, depending on the age of the kid, it might have to be $5. So you need to match your reward with the value of what you're asking your dog to do in the environment that you're working. So if it's at home, in your living room, and you're working on something the dog knows, you can use rewards that are like a penny. So biscuits, kibble, I've used my dog's dog food. That's fine. It's enough to say, you did it, great, here's a penny. I appreciate it, that was not a hard task, great. If I'm out in public, in a group, with a bunch of other dogs and a bunch of other people, and I want the dog, we're working on heel, or we're working on you know, a sit, stay, I need to up my reward value so that I'm paying this dog 50 bucks. We need to have some jerky treats. We need to have, maybe I need to go to cheese. You know, whatever this dog finds super, super important, it could be a tennis ball. You have to match that to the environmental uh, stimulus that you're working in. So if your rewards are not working, evaluate what's going on around you and what you're trying to give your dog. Pay them. What, how much are you paying them for what they're actually expecting of them? Because if you went to work and worked 40 hours and they paid you a dollar, you would not go to work anymore. So you need to look at that with your dog in the same mindset of, am I paying my dog enough for the behavior follow through that I'm expecting from them at this level? Now, eventually, you'll be able to move out of using lower rewards to no rewards. But initially, you have to match or exceed um, your value and your treats or your, or your reinforcement um, to match the intensity or what you're asking for of the environment. The second thing that I find people run into when they're using their rewards is the dog is over threshold. Your dog becomes so stressed out from the environment. Maybe it doesn't like other dogs. It's very nervous and reactive, lunging, barking, losing its stuff because there's other dogs all over and it just can't do it. That dog is not gonna stop and take treats. That dog is not gonna stop and play ball or tug. Um, they are going to be so stressed out and overwhelmed by all of the stuff going on around them that they, that valuable stuff, even if it's high, I've had dogs that won't even take hamburger or anything that you would think they would normally just suck right up because they're shutting down. They're too stressed out. They can't handle it. That means your environment is too stressful. You need to back out of that and you need to start in a lower stress environment for that particular dog. Those are the two main things that I find happen all the time. And then people go up. Oh, Treats don't work, not using them anymore. Oh, my ball doesn't work. You know, when we go out in public, it does, it's not a thing. So they just stop. But they're still exposing their dog to the stress. Or they're trying to pay their dog in broccoli instead of something that would be much more valuable to what they're asking the dog to do. So we're going to look at a wide variety of reinforcement, or rewards, I should say, um, to reinforce the behaviors that we want. And then we're gonna work with um, one of our fosters, Daisy, who's a seven month old pity mix, to kind of show you how I gauge what the dog finds reinforcing and how to put it on the scale of where it would go. So you can compare, does my dog prefer tennis balls to pieces of hot dog? Does my dog prefer to a rope toy to biscuits? That kind of thing. Okay, so I figured it makes sense to kind of just go over some of the things I got on the table here before we actually look at some dogs, you know, investigating the items that we have. And this way you can see just kind of a variety of things that uh, I might pull out to see, you know, does the dog give it value? Is it interested in the thing that I have? And then where, um, how much value the dog gives to that, where it ranks on our reward scale that we're working with. So 
some of the things are I like to use uh, soft items. So this one's stuffed, uh, this one is not, and this one's long. These are fun um, for tug or um, sometimes I'll you know tie a string or a leash and then pull it and the dog can chase it and try to grab at it. So if your dog is more of a soft chewer, um, they have a soft mouth, they hold things nicely, the soft items work really well. If you have a dog that has a much harder mouth and grabs things really solid, uh, these will rip obviously very easily. And for those dogs, I usually use like an actual rope. Um, this one's been through uh, the ringer a little bit, but I'd use an actual rope. This one's kind of a twofer because it has a ball and a rope attached to it together. Um, another one I like to use for my more heavy chewers, the ones that really grab and hold and love to play tug, are, um, this is a, a training, canvas training buoy. Um, and then, you know, you can use it for uh, retrieves and stuff. But I like to use these uh, for tug. And so I attach just a, an old leash that I've cut on the end and they can tug. Um, you'll see in the video, part of the video coming up, uh, Scout, this is like her favorite thing that we use for uh, reward. So that can have value in some dogs. Uh, tennis balls, tennis balls are a big one. If you have a ball dog, then tennis balls usually rank really, really high value. These are one of the items that I find Either the dogs love them and they're very, you know, think $75, $100 bill. These guys are, you know, high, high value dogs will do a lot for these or the dog really doesn't care. So you either have a ball dog or not a ball dog. And, you know, occasionally there'll be a middle item, but most of the time dogs really, really like them or they really don't care about them. So tennis balls, I always check and kind of see where the dog falls. Make sure you use ones that are size appropriate for your dog. I uh, have dogs all the way from six pounds all the way up to 102. So, you know, we use a bigger tennis ball, obviously for our medium to large size dogs. And then I have smaller ones for like my Chihuahua, who's eight pounds. And uh, that way they can, you know, grip it and you don't have to worry about them inhaling it or choking on it. Um, also, my dogs do not get tennis balls unless they are supervised because these can definitely get stuck back in the throat, um, especially if the dog tries to put more than one in their mouth. So we only use tennis balls um, for supervised either fetch or for training, uh, depending on what we're doing. So I usually, those are kind of a good, you know, roundabout way of those are kind of the things I check as far as toys and what the dog might want to engage in when um, we are finding value in items. Like any of these items you find value in, let's see, do you like to play tug? Do you like to play fetch? Um, or is it just something that you like to take and shake, you know? So that's kind of where I start. And then I move into more of our food items. And this is because oftentimes dogs like toys and toys are fun, but food as you work up in value of food or treats, um, the dogs usually prefer the food over the toys. That's not always the case. I've had dogs, like I said, tennis balls, $100 bill. That's the highest thing that they want. Um, and that's fine, that's great. And that's what you use for working in the high stress environments or the things that are harder for your dog to work through. Where I always check toys and stuff first and then move into kibble, you know, different types of treats, etc. So I'll give you examples of some of those treats. So we've got, um, We've got some biscuits. So these are milk bone, little tiny milk bone training treat biscuits. Uh, these I usually test biscuits first because they're kind of dry. They don't have a big smell to them. Um, so they're usually lower on the totem pole of food value for the dogs. Uh, kibble also sometimes can be um, about equivalent to the biscuits. So if I'm working, like I said, with the dog in the living room and I want them to do something they're familiar with, I might use their kibble. If they're foodie enough for their kibble, we'll pay them in kibble. Uh, we might do a couple small biscuits. So usually I check biscuits and then we move up into some of our training treats, more of the jerky, they're semi-moist, uh, squishy. Uh, not not wet, but you know, they just uh, chewy, I guess is the way to think about it. And then um, with that, these are a lot more stinkier. Oftentimes dogs will prefer these over biscuits. And so um, 
these are usually my step up from there. Now, sometimes I get dogs that they don't really care about biscuits. They don't really care about a lot of the different types of, you know, training treats that I have presented or brought to, you know, to display to see what they're interested in. Cause maybe they're just not really a food motivated dog, which is fine. Um, but I have found that these here, they're kind of big jerk, like chewy, squishy squares, um, are made by wellness. And I've found a lot of dog clients that I've had, their dogs love this. I mean, even if they're not big on a lot of the other training treats I've brought, you know, along with me, these are ones that usually get the dog's attention. And I always break them up. I mean, I can get 20 rewards out of one of these squares. So we're, you're not giving your dog this whole piece. I mean, you can, but that's kind of a waste of a good amount of reward. So I always break them up. And so that you can use them, you know, you get multiple times out of that for one square. The next one that I always kind of try, and this one's similar to like the tennis ball, I feel, is dogs either love it and it's high value, it has a pretty decent value behind it, or they don't like it. So it's the freeze dried treats. So you have your freeze dried treats. Daisy. Um, you have your freeze dried treats and dogs either put it in their mouth and go oh because they're kind of dry and they're not really sure about the texture and they might spit it out and say i'm not really sure i don't want that i don't like that um where other dogs are like this is the best because it's raw food it's just freeze dried so they're super smelly and they're super you know tasty for a dog it's just sometimes the texture throws them off and they don't want them so i find that I get some dogs that, nope, even if they're foodie dogs, they say, I don't, that's weird. I don't like that. Um, my one shepherd, when we started to use them, was like, is that medication? What is that? So try it. You can try them, see what your dog thinks. And um, they can be a little pricey. So obviously, if it's a higher value, I don't just hand them out all the time. These are things I save for when we're working on stuff that it takes the dog um, more mental effort they have to they need more incentive to follow through because it's more stress or highly active environment that they're just excited to be in so those are things that i'll save the higher value stuff for there now lastly on our treat scale i use a lot of human food when it comes to having the dog yes i see you um having the dog look at what they value and where it falls in reward. So I use ham, steak scraps, pork, cheese. Those are things that like, if I have extra of something that I might save, like especially I have two boys. So sometimes they don't eat everything on their plate. And I'm like, you know, those pieces of, you know, meat that you didn't eat, swap them aside. I'm gonna use those next time I'm working on a dog that has stress dealing with, you know, other dogs or people or something. Then it gives me another, just another, um, oh, hundred dollar bill, another incentive in my toolbox of rewards for that dog or whichever dog I might be working with. So on the, on today we've got, we've got some ham and then I also have some, uh, leftover pork. So those are the things that we'll, we'll have on the table to see, you know, what the dogs find interesting. Yes, that's a good girl. All right, so we have Daisy here. Good girl. And she is about seven months old, we're guessing. Um, she had a rough start to life and she's a very nervous puppy. And so we are basically are fostering her and working on building her confidence in um, everything because she didn't have any exposure to pretty much anything when she came to us. So she is a foodie. She does like toys. There it is. Um, so sometimes, sometimes toys are fun. What do you think? Get it. Get it. Good girl. Yeah, I'm going to shake it. Good girl. in toys. Um, I know from experience of working with her that toys are fun but once she gets nervous toys kind of they kind of go away. Now she's definitely a dog that loves to be pet. 
Petting is a very uh, rewarding thing for her. So we use petting um, for reinforcement. So if I'm working on something and she's too nervous to take treats, she doesn't want to play because it's very stressful for her, we just do a, you know, a nice, not bippity 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 pet that just can make the dog uncomfortable. With nice salad, you know, you've got this good job. Uh, petting can help the dog go, okay, this is what you want me to do. Or I'm, I'm not dying, I can handle this. So she, she loves to come in, she's a cuddler, and uh, petting is definitely something we use when some of our other go-to things are not working because she is too nervous in her environment, because she is a nervous dog. So, we've got biscuits, Busy. and so we can show her, usually I show them and they can see, you know, do you want the biscuit, did you take the biscuit, and then move into, you got biscuits and we've got higher value stuff. Okay, so she wants the jerky. She'll take both, but then when you give them the option, she picks the jerky treats. So then I know that that would trump the biscuits for her as far as value level. That biscuits have that, you know, value, they're valuable, she likes that. Um, but the jerky treats would be a higher value. So on my reward scale, I would mark that as a higher value item. Then I like to move into, we got the squares and the freeze dried treats. So we come down in here and we try to say, hey, we've got these and we've got these. And then I kind of present them and pull them away. So she likes the squares. Ooh, I know what we got there. All right, so I would say these are about equal value. We've got the, the wellness chewy squares and we've got the freeze dried stuff. Yes, good girl. Yeah, good girl. So those are about equal value for her. So that's good to know. So then I would put them in one hand, and I would take some ham in the other. And then we would present. We got ham and, oh, <laughs> yeah. Oftentimes, human food trumps um, dog treats. Not all the time. I've had dogs that, you know, would do anything for a begging strip and they don't want anything else, you know, and that's like those Twinkies of the dog world. So it's, it's all about what your dog prefers, you know. So the whole point of this is to give you an idea of having multiple choices, multiple items. So it gives you more things in your toolbox when you're working with your dog to say, okay, I'm not gonna pay you a hundred dollar bill for sitting in the living room when I could save that for actually going out in public and having to work on sitting where we're, we're sitting in an outdoor patio eating lunch, you know. That's when you want your $100 bills. You want to use them for the environmental stimulus that you're working in instead of giving them out, you know, when the dog's really doing something very easy. Um, or if you have, a, you know, a dog that prefers toys over food, then there's no reason you need to use food when you could use toys for play uh, or tennis balls for fetch. If your dog's a ball dog over anything else, use the ball. But this way you have an idea of how to look into what your dog prefers, what actually has value to your dog particularly. Um, I have several dogs and they are not all the same across the board and so I have to adjust my rewards per dog when I'm working on each dog. And some of them, you know, I have, mine are all pretty foody, and so certain treats work really well. So if I'm working with them as a group, I'll pull out the stuff that everybody thinks is about the same value. Um, but other than that, if you've got multiple dogs, I recommend doing this exercise with each dog individually so that you can see what they care about and what they don't. All right, now we're gonna move on and you'll see a couple other dogs and going through the same thing, but seeing where they rank, you know, their stuff is different than how Daisy thinks about it. All right, so we have Scout here, and she's a good example of a dog that's toy motivated and food motivated. So 
Yeah. Yeah. So she loves to play tug. Tug is definitely a reward for her. It re it's a good uh, use of oh, reinforcing a behavior I want her to work on. Uh, we are currently working on teaching her to retrieve birds. And so she's obviously not the normal breed. Um, so she has a pretty hard mouth. So I use tug oftentimes as a uh, reward for bringing me the bird and not destroying the bird because for her that would be great to grab it, shake it, you know, pluck all the feathers. Awesome. So I like to use different types of reinforcement. Now she does like ball. Good girl. Yeah. Good girl. So we have a ball. Now let's see. Yes, I know you love this thing. So she prefers, well, we'll see. So we play tug and then we throw the ball. Now, we know ball's fun, it has value, but it doesn't have as much value as our tug toy. And so we would move up to, we'll use a biscuit. So I like to tug. If we've got a dog that's tugging and I got my biscuit, and I'm gonna wipe it down in front of their nose. Oh yes. So biscuit, outranks tug toy. I would say they're probably about the same value um, because she loves, she'll come right back at it. Now, we move up the row. Good girl. And so we can do this. We can do this. We can toss the tree. So she come, yes, good girl. And then we can toss the tree. So then we know that the jerky treats are higher value. Usually, if you move up, I know that these things are higher value for her. So we have it, and then we toss it, and she goes for that. You can try, because sometimes movement is a key. So we have the treat. Yeah, there you go. And so she still enjoys this. This is still fun. Um, but food outranks it. We have the steak scraps, or the pork scraps. Yeah, I know. You know what I have, don't you? So then I know that she likes toys, she likes ball, tug trumps ball, and then food trumps, tr or trumps tug. So I can use those in different sequencing depending on what I'm working with. So it's a good way for you to go through with your dog on how to kind of start into it. I would say food usually cancels out toys unless you got a dog that's super super bully. Um, you'll see the next dog is more food motivated than toy motivated. Okay, so we have Widgeon here, our two-year-old Chihuahua. Widgeon in particular, she Likes to play when she's at home in certain settings, but as soon as we go out in public, her stress level goes up and playing shuts off. She does not feel comfortable enough to engage in play because she's got to have herself all together so she can look at the environment. So for her specifically, toys are not high enough value for me to use out and about. Now at home, when we're in the house and doing some stuff, um, certain toys do have some value, but they're very low. Would you? Yeah. She's like, nope, I've seen this fox a million times, I don't want it. So I usually go through the, the squeaky stuff first. Um, they have these in smaller size, but obviously we're just using the stuff that we had on the table. She does find. Widget. Yeah, what do I have? That's the big ball. You like the little ball. She does like to play fetch. Good girl. Yeah, I know. You like food more, we know. So if your dog likes the toys, then I pick one that they like. For her, she likes the tennis ball. So then I go to low value food items. So I have the biscuits. She knows I have the biscuits. But I have the biscuits. So I'm gonna break these up because she does not need a whole biscuit. It's huge for you. So what I do is I throw the ball and 
she would rather stay for the biscuits. So that tells me that the ball is fun and great, but the food has higher value. So then I like to move through, and I put the other stuff in my pocket, the, the jerky e stuff. So, okay, so you're going to take some higher value stuff, and you're going to take the biscuit. I usually show the dog the one they've already received. So she gets to see the biscuits. I know, you know it's it. And then, yeah, okay, yep. So then she'll go back. Now this is just for you to figure out what the dog finds more valuable. Um, so here's the biscuits. She would like those, but she went for the jerky or stuff first. So she'll take those. A lot of foodie dogs will take these and then the other. You have to chew those. Sit. Um, now, then I would do the same thing with the higher value uh, treats and then move up to um, the meat or the cheese, whatever you're going to use for high value. Usually if you have a foodie, once you start to move up the chain of food treats, you know, up to human food, and some people aren't comfortable using human food, that's fine if you can find a dog treat that you want to use that's high enough value. But I like to use that for when we're working on something really hard. Some dogs, you get them as a puppy, you work on socialization, you get them out and about, you never really have an issue. Other dogs, you're going to run into some, some major issues. And so I always like to have that extra level of valued reinforcement uh, to use. So I have a high, high value reward that I save in my training toolbox to pull out when I say, hey, I know this is stressful. I know we're right under threshold and that's a lot to ask, but I have a $100 bill. And so I can pay them in my meat scraps or my piece of cheese. And if you've ever done behavior modification stuff with me, with your dogs, you know that that can make or break it. You can go, oh, we aren't getting anywhere at first. I had a couple pieces of cheese. Now I have my dog's attention. We can really start to work through this and help the dog relax in a situation that normally made them fall apart. So my recommendation to you is to pull out a piece of paper and get out a bunch of things that you would consider rewards for your dog and then go through them. Figure out where the dog uh, falls on um, what they find that as actual reward and has, has value to them and what things don't. The things that they don't, you don't use those. You don't need those. Um, another one that I did touch on a little bit when we were going through the items is petting. So Widgen, our Chihuahua, petting causes her stress. She has certain times that she's comfortable and she would like to be pet, uh, but when she's stressed out, she does not want you to touch her. So petting would not be a reward for that specific dog. I do not use petting for her to reward her for uh, behaviors that I want because that just adds stress to what we're trying to do. So a lot of times hers is more food, food based. Um, with my shepherd, Ranger, who you'll see in some of these videos, his, um, foodiness shuts off when he becomes over nervous or anxious. He's like, too anxious, I can't eat, mom, I won't eat. Even if I were to pull out a piece of steak, nope, he's uncomfortable, he's not gonna do it. So for him, mom pets, me petting him, nice solid, just good job, you got this, um, is a reward for him and that's a high, high value reward. So I save that for him specifically when we're working through things that might be more stressful that I know he doesn't want food, he's not going to take food. Um, the vet, the vet, that's always fun. Um, when we go to the vet, he gets a little stressed out and anxious. And so we just work through that and I use petting as, re as reinforcement, as a reward for that situation. Once we leave the vet, he'll take food all day. So you want to use what works for your dog and what your dog um, assigns value to those items. So it can be petting, it can be toys, it can be an assortment of treats, it can be their kibble. Um, we will go into in the next video, um, praise clickers, those are secondary reinforcements. Primary reinforcements are things that are rewarding in themselves. Uh, secondary reinforcements are things that you make valuable. You give them value. So by using our treats, our toys, 
petting, our social interaction, um, oftentimes we are making ourselves become a secondary reinforcer. We are giving ourselves more value to our dog. Some dogs, they love you. They want, I mean, we would like to think all of our dogs love us. But as far as when it comes to environmental stimulus, some dogs prefer the company of their person. Other dogs, hounds especially, sense top priority. They're out there to smell everything. That is high, high value reward for them. So all of a sudden, the owner, you, the human, have to come around and say, hey, I'm still valuable. You should still care about me being here and doing the behaviors I ask, regardless of the high value sense that we might come across. That is a very real life situation where working with your dog and using rewards to tell them that you are worth their time um, plays out in the end when you come across that type of a situation. So I want you to think about what your dog likes, where it falls, and make up your own reward scale at home. So then as you go through stuff and start working with your dog, you can start to kind of figure out what you should be matching, what type of rewards you should be matching, or what things might not work at all. Um, and then what are those $100 items that you want to save in your back pocket to pull out when it's necessary.